Hey everybody and welcome back to another episode of Field Facts with Forrest. On today's show we're going to talk about the difference in greater and lesser Canada goose hunting. All right, so this is another one of our big questions that we get. Um, you know, guys hunting in, in different parts of the country are curious what it's like, what they can expect on their next guided hunt uh, when they go, say, from New York out to Oklahoma to go hunt lesser Canada's out there in the central flyway. Or for guys who are used to hunting lessers who are looking to go hunt graders, say, on their freelance trip to Canada, they wonder what the differences are, okay? So we're going to talk quite a bit, not only about the differences in the geese, but also in the differences in hunting styles. Now, I want to clear a couple things up right off the get-go. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what a greater Canada is and what a lesser Canada is, okay? Uh, thanks to the biologists rebranding these geese, there used to be, I think it was 13 or, or 11 different subspecies of Canada goose. Now they've divided it up into two. So, you can imagine there's a lot of variations in these geese uh, that now different what used to be subspecies are all lumped together as either uh, big Canada geese or cackling Canada geese, all right? And I'm going to come back to that here in a minute. Let's start off with the greater Canada goose or big geese. Typically, those are going to be your 6 to 14 or bigger, depending on, on the fish story you want to tell, uh, Canada geese, all right? Those are going to be the ones you see in the park, the ones with a nice deep honk, uh, the ones you listen to when you're out bass fishing in the summer, sitting there barking at each other, making all sorts of really cool sounds that maybe David Coleman on his tube call can make, but for the rest of us, we're fairly hopeless on making some of those cool sounds, all right? So uh, those are the kind of geese we're talking about they'll breed anywhere from in your city or your town uh, to all the way through Canada. Uh, typically they don't go as far north. These bigger geese tend to have a smaller migration range and we're learning a lot about the molt migrators in the Mississippi Flyway and how they do travel a lot but um, a lot of times they're not going up above the Arctic Circle like some of the lessers will uh, and they don't typically go as far south unless weather really forces them to go. Um, they're really fun to hunt because you don't need a ton of decoys. Anybody can go out and get after them, and the calling uh, it doesn't require near as much noise. So they're 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 pretty cool geese. Uh, but but overall, that's kind of a, a summary of the greater or big Canada goose. Now to get to the cackling Canada geese, I want to clear something up, and it's one of my biggest pet peeves. In case you can't already tell, um, there is a difference between a lesser Canada goose and a cackler. So even though they put all of these geese into one range called the cackling goose, there's a big difference, all right? I'm gonna start out uh, talking about lessers as we know them and, and how um, they're, most of their subspecies would be uh, talked about. All right, so lessers typically breed in western Alaska, northern Alaska, and on into none of it. Uh, and then from there, they'll migrate down through typically the Pacific and Central Flyways primarily. Now, some of these smaller uh, Canada geese will get mixed up and they'll branch out uh, some into the Mississippi Flyway. You'll see them in Arkansas occasionally. Uh, you, you might see some in, in western Missouri, uh, Illinois. There, there's a few kind of sprinkled here and there. Uh, they're kind of like black ducks, how they'll, they, they primarily stick to their area, but you will find them on occasion uh, elsewhere, okay? Um, so they'll, they'll work down through all of the flyways, but primarily the Central and Pacific Flyway, uh, and they, their honk sounds mainly like a Canada goose. A little bit higher pitch than your honker that you're going to hear in the park, but it still sounds like a Canada goose. Um, now to cacklers. And for all my guys out there on the West Coast, I gotcha. Okay, so cacklers, they'll, they'll breed in similar areas, but typically only breed in Western Alaska and in through the Aleutian Islands in the case of uh, Aleutian Canadas. And I'm going to lump Aleutian Canadas in with cacklers because they act similarly. They sound remotely the same, 
uh, and, and they're more like a cackler than they are uh, their typical lesser friends or cousins, uh, say what were formerly Hutchinson, Richardson's, um, you know, so, some of those little bit bigger, lesser Canada geese. Okay, so as these geese, uh, after they breed and, and rear their young there in western Alaska typically, they'll work, they'll either cut and follow the coast down uh, through British Columbia and all down into uh, Washington, Oregon, or California, or they'll do like some of the, uh, the information shown now with specs where they'll actually cut directly across. And a lot of the geese actually do that. Uh, we're, we're learning more and more with the, the technology that's coming out these days. But these geese will work their way down into specifically the uh, Pacific coast. Uh, and typically where there's areas of big mountain ranges, they won't even go east of those first mountain ranges. Most of them are, are very coastal birds and um, it will even roost in brackish or salt water. Uh, so, so for you guys on the West Coast, and again, I may make a few mistakes here. I'm from Colorado, and I'll be up front and tell you, I've only gotten to hunt cacklers uh, and Aleutians maybe a combined five times, six times, but they are distinctly different. Um, so not only do their migration patterns dictate that they're going to be almost strictly on the West Coast, um, but also they just act differently. They're a very different bird. They make a different noise. Uh, in, in fact, the, the sound is, is um, it, it's just very different. Um, let me start off here with a quick demonstration of a lesser Canada, uh, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and, and blow a, a cackler call and show you the difference between the two. Okay, so your lesser Canada is going to be nice, high-pitched, but sharp clucks, some moans, um, and just just some some really neat noises. Okay. <laughs> All right, so that's that's a pretty good idea of um, what a, a lesser is going to sound like. A cackler is going to be a very, very different sound. I'm actually going to grab, um, this is an old PSL uh, T20 uh, modified uh, predator call uh, that my, my buddy Ken White in California sent me. It's a great spec call. So a speckle belly call works better to tell you the difference in pitch of these geese than a Canada goose call does, okay? Um, so I'll go ahead and, and blow a little bit of a cackler, a Lucian look on this one. And it's almost exclusively clucks, double clucks, and, and spit notes. They don't really moan. It, it's just a, a bunch of chirping, really. I mean, we're, we're talking about a, a three pound goose that could be dwarfed by a large mallard or pintail. Uh, so, so it's a real high pitched cluck. Not a whole lot to it, um, but you can tell it's an extremely different sound than what a lesser Canada makes. Um, also, they act differently, okay? So as to where lesser Canadas are gonna fly in flocks of anywhere from your typical flock to, you know, 10 to all the way upwards of a couple thousand. You know, you'll see these walls of geese in, in Oklahoma and West Texas, and, and it's really cool. Not saying that the cacklers won't, but typically um, cacklers and Aleutians are going to be in a little bit smaller flock size, typically maxing out at a few hundred uh, to maybe a thousand. Um, so not only that, they, they work differently as well. Lessers, um, that's where you'll see big wide spins and tornadoes uh, and, and they'll work down and, and they'll, they'll get down low and, and kind of crawl up the spread and finish right in the hole for you uh, as opposed to a cackler if given the opportunity I've seen them backpedal at 40, 50 yards in the air and come straight down like a mallard coming through the trees. Okay, so they fly like a lighter or like the lighter and smaller bird that they are. Um, so, so very different birds, rant over. Cacklers are not lessers. And for some of you guys in the Mississippi Flyway who say, hey, I got a cackler, it's possible. Probably not. Maybe go on YouTube, watch a video, listen to some sound files, uh, and, and maybe tone it down and, and just start with a lesser until you get someone who will back you up and say, yeah, that's, you know, that, that's a purple cackler or, or something like that. Um, so that's the difference between those. Now, I'm going to move on. So that's the difference between those. 
Now, I'm going to move on, and, uh, and we're going to start talking about hunting greater Canada geese, okay? Like I said, they're uh, typically a little bit easier to deal with than the lessers. They don't usually require quite as much work. Um, you can get away with hunting some smaller spreads, and, and it's, they're, they're a, a real fun goose to hunt. And heck, some of the best memories I have are, you know, early season. It's September 1st and, and you know, I'm, I'm hunting in, on the west slope of Colorado or something in their early season. And while the numbers might not be great, man, the geese sure are ready to play. They haven't gotten pestered in months. Um, you, you've got young of the year geese that are, are seeing decoys for the first time and man, it is fun. Okay. So we're going to start and we're going to talk about decoys. All right. So when I'm setting up a greater spread, typically I'm not going to be using as many decoys as I would if I was hunting lessers. Now, not to say that I won't run a big, big spread for honkers, but to set them up the way they should be sitting in the field, if you use 50 dozen decoys to hunt honkers, you should probably be covering five to seven acres. So you, you want to be thinking about these geese and, and watch the way they sit in the field. Typically, they're very loose. And especially early, early in the year, you'll see them sitting in family groups. Um, so I like to set them up uh, a pair here. Then 30 yards off to one side, we'll set up a group of five. And then 40 yards the other direction, there's going to be a group of 10. Um, with the main group of decoys being about where you want to land them uh, and have them and settle in and, and finish for you. Um, now, a lot of people like to reference a kill hole when we're talking about decoy spreads. And with greater Canada's, I don't like to think of it so much as a hole as an alley to a parking lot. All right. Uh, I've found that in my experience, greater Canada's don't like to fly over the decoys a whole lot. They're kind of like cranes in that aspect uh, to where they, they would rather fly over an open area uh, where if you've got a nice big ball of lesser, say like we're, we're hunting the front range of Colorado here, like we did with uh, Jeff Caldwell and front range guide service. Um, if you set up a, a big ball of decoys, that's kind of strung out. Um, a lot of times graders will, will work the edges and they'll kind of skirt behind you and they, they just don't ever seem to quite center up because they don't like to fly right over the decoys. So if you open up alleys and, and leave areas for them to work into your kill hole or parking lot, um, I like to think of it being a, a pretty big space when I'm hunting graders, uh, you're going to have a lot more success. They're going to work out and they're going to come up those alleys. Uh, if you leave them a big runway, that's, that's what they like the most, all right? Um, so, so think about doing that. But again, even with a smaller spread, five, ten dozen decoys, you're going to cover some space. Um, and, and here's another thing. Guys, don't be shy to spread your decoys out. And you're going to hear this in lots of episodes, but especially when you're working silhouettes, man, spread them out. Make your decoys look like geese, not a hunting spread. When you come up and you see geese sitting in your field, they're not sitting all clustered up typically, uh, especially graders. They're not going to be in one ball. Um, they're going to be spread out in different corners of the field. So don't be afraid to set some decoys out loose. Personally, I would rather set a realistic spread and have a couple groups land a long way out uh, and take the chances that I'll probably be able to call some to the hole um, as opposed to setting a tight spread where everything might be in a real comfortable shooting range, but it doesn't look natural to the geese. So they work in and then may skirt off in the end or flare because, you know, you've got everything concentrated right around where you're hiding and it brings all the attention to your hide. Um, so, so keep those things in mind. Spread these decoys out. Put a lot of space between them. Very small groups, a pair, three, five, ten. Um, you know, if, if you set a group of 20, that would probably be your biggest group of, of honkers sitting together outside of, you know, real cold weather scenarios or sitting on ice or, or typically. We're, we're just talking about fields and the average greater Canada goose here. Um, so that, uh, you know, I, I mentioned hiding there. The biggest thing I can say with hunting greater Canada geese is be still. Uh, yeah, heck, I can remember back, I don't know, it was probably only 
five, seven years ago hunting greater Canada's when they were real prominent on the front range of, of northern Colorado here. And, uh, you know, heck, I was, I was hunting in big feet and just laying there in Carhartts and a camo pullover. And as long as you're still and don't draw attention to yourself, you can have some success. Now, I'm not saying that you should just go out there and lay in the middle of your decoys with no camouflage by any means, but I'm saying um, emphasis on being still and thinking about hiding, okay? The less attention you can draw to yourself, the better. And for that reason, uh, and for the reason that we're, we're setting uh, loose spreads with typically smaller numbers of decoys, I like hiding outside of the decoys for greater Canada's. Um, I like to hunt on an edge, ideally, uh, or if I'm hunting at a layouts or a pit blinds, a little bit different scenario where you can kind of hide in the decoys, but typically I like having um, my hide be just on the edge of the spread. That way, as the geese come in and they finish, when they're starting to get down and they're really, you know, seriously looking for a place to land, they're not looking at you. Um, and as these geese are trying to do that, keep in mind, the more you blow a call, the more they hear, and they do have directional hearing, just like all of us. If they hear you over to the side and they're trying to set up right here in, in front of them, that's going to draw their attention. So when the geese are doing what you want them to, just shut up and let them do it. Um, yeah, so many guys ask us, uh, and I think we, we got a, a question just recently here um, from a gentleman who's been having trouble working geese. And my first question, um, you know, he, he says he's, he's on the X and, um, you know, the birds just don't want to come. They'll, they'll kind of work kind of close and then they'll veer away. How much are you calling? Uh, and I think calling can a lot of times be the demise of a lot of good setups for a hunt. Um, man, it feels good to call a bird in, but sometimes it's better to just be quiet. Let them work in, let them do what they're going to do, and trust that you are where they want to be and that your decoys are going to be enough. Okay, so uh, just to, to finish up with the, the hide, make sure you're well hidden, and typically if you can be outside of the decoys, it'll leave for a more realistic spread for the geese to ask fewer questions on their way in. Okay, um, coming back to the calling, my rule of thumb with hunting greater Canada's is less is more. Okay, uh, you're gonna have a deeper tune call. Uh, flutes work just fine still. Uh, a lot of people feel like a short read's the only way to go. I kill a lot of geese with flutes. So for some of you guys still out there rocking big rivers, keep at it. Um, Less is more, and I like to be soft unless I have to get loud, okay? So the least amount of calling I can give them, the better. I don't want them to know where I'm hiding, and I don't want to give myself too many mistakes or too many opportunities to make mistakes. Um, now, when they're working, they're, they're a very different working goose than a lesser. So these big Canada's, think of it like a 747. They need some serious real estate to make their turns, to come in and, and to work in the way that they'd like to comfortably. So um, thinking about working a group of geese coming, you think about them being off in the distance, they're coming in, they're, they're looking good, but they're a little high, they're gonna make a swing, okay? So they're gonna pass over you and they're gonna typically work out downwind. And when they start getting out there, it's difficult as hunters and goose callers to let your bird get farther away from you, but let them. You gotta let them go to bring them back, all right? Let them get out there uh, 100, 200 yards even. Um, as long as they've shown some interest, you can let them get out there and then try to turn them back, okay? Um, so I'm gonna kinda go through a little bit of a calling sequence for graders where I'm gonna start with geese in the distance, but coming my direction, okay? Um, that, that's key. I'm not talking about running traffic on these geese. I'm talking about when these geese are coming to you, all right? So um, I'm gonna work them in, let them come over the top, and let them swing way out, okay? So I'm gonna kinda narrate a little bit in between, but I'm just gonna make a few noises here uh, to, to give you an idea of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about soft and minimal calling, okay? So, we've seen the geese, they're out there 400 yards and kind of working. I'm not going to give them a whole lot. I'm going to give them just a little bit um, to, to keep them coming, just enough to keep them interested, okay? So, they're out there a few hundred yards. All right. 
at this point, they've definitely shown interest. They're coming. They're getting inside that about 100-yard mark where I'm thinking, man, I need you all to sit down and let's get ready to shoot them. Okay, so I'm going to start backing off just a little bit. A, again, to keep myself hidden, and B, just to, to, to keep these geese at peace and, and ease them into the spread. Okay, so 100 yards and in. Let them come over the top. Typically, if they're going to work directly over me, I don't like to make a lot of noise when birds are right over me. I don't want them looking down and, and peeking in. So I'll let them come over me, and I'll let them start to turn, and I'll just kind of keep up that same pace, all right? And as they start to get out around that 75 to 100-yard range, I'll start thinking about picking up that tone. Now, there's, there's a couple different comebacks um, that I've found work really, really well. All right, uh, and it's typically two geese going back and forth, and it's either a moan and a cluck, or a spit note and a cluck, or a spit note and a moan. Basically, you just want to think about two geese kind of getting in an argument, and geese are like teenage girls. They love drama, so make a dramatic scene. Make a fight. You know, when you hear those geese, uh, you know, sitting on the bass ponds in the summer, they're going to get angry and they're going to make some noises. Also, you let those geese get out their ways, you try to do some of the trickier, cooler sounding stuff. If you make a mistake, it's not like doing it through a megaphone right in their face. Got a little distance. Uh, if there's any wind, it kind of helps uh, buffer some of those mistakes. So we're going to start getting a little more excited around that 75 to 100 yard range. All right. And I get excited, and typically that's when you'll see these big old geese make a nice tight turn to where you can see the backs of both their wings. And I'm telling you, if you see the backs of both of their wings, you win. It's game on. They're making that turn and they're coming back. So start to dial things back down. Um, you, you notice kind of a flow in those. And if you listen to geese in the park, especially in the springtime when they're, when they're real agitated around nests, you'll listen and there's a natural flow to these arguments. Um, they don't just stay a million miles an hour for, for you know, for, for even 30 or 40 seconds. That would be a, a ridiculously huge goose fight. They're usually three to 10 seconds long. Um, so, so keep that in mind when you're calling. Then once those geese are coming back, I'm going right back into some of that lay down stuff. <laughs> Just real nice and easy. And there's times where I like to get excited. Um, you know, Fred Zink did a great job describing goose calling, and it, it's it's aggression. It's it's just the mindset. So geese get aggressive over food and territory, and if you let them know there's food. Um, say, say they're trying to land off one end or the other. If you get, get excited and, and pick up that cadence and that tone again, they're going to think that there's something worth fighting for where that sound's coming from. Um, so use your calling sparingly. Less is more. If you save it and keep it in your back pocket until you need it for when those geese go out at 100, 200, 300 yards, then you can get on them as few times as possible let them turn and come back and come out and check what you got, okay? Um, so that only leaves shot calling. And when I'm calling the shot on big Canada geese, again, they're 747s. Changing their direction of travel is tough. They got a lot of momentum going one direction, and, and it, it takes a lot of work. So as soon as the first ones start touching down, keep in mind I'm, I'm thinking of a flock here, uh, you know, five, ten geese starting to work the way down. Ideally, if you can let one or two start to get to where their their feet out and getting ready to touch the ground, if you call the shot, then those things are toast. If you want to let them get them the land, check them for bands. Yeah, sure, great, fine. Um, but as far as just 
putting geese on the ground. When they land, they typically aren't stacked forward and backward. They're stacked sideways. They're, they're spread out, fanned out for everybody. So the guys in your blind, you call the shot, everybody's going to have a shot when they're nice and spread out like that. Um, and that's a pretty good overall uh, summary of, of, of how I like to hunt greater Canada's. Okay, so we'll move on to hunting lesser Canada's and talk about some of the decoys. I'm going to cover all the same topics. Okay, so lesser Canada geese, decoys, we're using lots because that's how they live together. They're getting to be more and more like snow geese. And uh, for some of you guys in the southern central flyway, Kansas, Oklahoma, West Texas, you know what I'm talking about. They'll go out and they'll be feeding, uh, you know, in the places where I was guiding, typically a, a good feed or, or an average feed is going to be two to 3,000 geese, and a big one's going to be 10 or better. So 10,000 geese we're talking about going to the same place flying in huge flocks, um, you know, with some of the smaller flocks in those areas uh, averaging on, on the side of 50 to 100 geese, you know, there's a smaller group of lessers, um, with the big groups being uh, what you hear guys talking about spins, all right, and that's going to be your groups of 500 to 1,000 plus geese, enough that as they're working down on a calm wind day, they have to tornado, and you'll see layers of geese as you're looking up, it's like multiple layers of geese and it's it's cool um so so it's it's a really neat deal um now with these lots of decoys again spacing keep it in mind keep it real don't make it convenient for your shooting uh and i say that as far as a max range of decoys don't be shy to spread these things out um make it look real uh if you take 50 dozen decoys, but you pack it into a 30-yard radius from the pit, it doesn't look any better than five dozen decoys would. In fact, it probably looks worse. So take these big spreads and cover some ground with them. When you watch these geese feed, yeah, there's going to be five, ten thousand in a field, but they're going to cover two-thirds of the field. So that's where you'll see these guys taking pictures when they're scouting of just hillsides covered in geese. And that's what makes it awesome. Gosh, they're so cool. So take these decoys, spread it out, mimic what you saw the night before. If you got 20 dozen decoys, great, set them up. If you got 120 dozen decoys and you got enough guys to put them out, do it. Um, you know, it, it's, it's good to have big numbers and spread them out. My theory is if I can trick the geese from a long way away into thinking it's real, it's less convincing I have to do as they get closer. The less skeptical they are at a distance, the more success you're going to have. Um, now, as opposed to where the greater Canada's like their alleys and parking lots to land, lesser Canada's aren't so picky. They will fly, you could, you could set up, let, let's just say you set up a big ball with a tail kind of filtering down that's a little loose. Um, so, so in theory, your big ball is going to be the big feed where you're going to have uh, your highest concentration of food, you're setting it up like that, uh, and, and where you've got the most aggressive feeding geese, and the rest are filtered out looser and looser and looser towards the tail of the spread. They'll fly right up the tail of that spread and set in a loose area, all right? I'm talking, you know, heck, if you leave them two yards, three yards between decoys, they'll land in those. Uh, and again, keeping in mind with what I talked about in the last video and, and what I'm going to touch on lots, if you spread these silhouettes out, it's going to look more realistic. So if you leave a, a, a let's say a five yard or a three yard hole, um, you know, or pockets here and there, if, if you leave a couple shooting or, or kill pockets spread out in front, um, you're going to have these geese filter in. And as they work towards you, I like to have them uh, have a few open, looser areas in front of me where I want to shoot with the decoys packed fairly tight where I'm hiding and just beyond me, just a little bit, so I don't get these geese trying to come up and land right in my grill. Granted, it's cool when you can catch them and they get really, really close, but you're going to have more success with these big flocks by, again, keeping the attention off of you. Let them land 15 yards in front of you, 20 yards in front of you. That's just fine. That's a great shot, and it gives you actually a better chance to kill more geese with better efficiency. Okay, So um, again, our hypothetical dense hole with a loose tail, leave 10 yards, 15 yards from your feet or from your boot bags and your layouts or however you're hiding, uh, and then start 
throwing out a couple looser spots, little three yard holes, they'll come up the spread and they'll start filtering into these little holes. Um, and they don't have to go out, they won't work uh, quite as wide as a greater Canada goose. They don't need as much real estate to get turned around. Um, so, so they work a little bit better. Uh, and because of these decoys being a little bit tighter, you can actually hide in the decoys more effectively. You can use some of the S5 socks um, that, that we've seen some of our pictures and videos out. Um, you can lay in the decoys and it can be extremely effective and you can shoot these geese really, really close, which is awesome. Uh, they'll, they'll get down low right over the tops of the decoys and they'll just tiptoe and they'll work their way closer and closer and closer and closer until they're in your grill and it's just awesome okay um so there, there's a few different ways i like to set the spread um a lot of it has to do with the uh with the wind okay so i mentioned spins in a no wind situation i also mentioned where these geese are right kansas oklahoma west texas the wind is never ever ever calm there so you're probably going to be hunting in some wind these geese will go out and they will work out nice and low for you but um, if you get the scenario where you don't have any wind i would spread these decoys way downwind of you downwind being you know i don't know 400 yards I'll throw some big spreads out there because what that does is even though there's no wind to help them come down, if, if I'm hiding here, I want them to go way out there so they have more time to lose altitude and lose altitude because again, I like them to tiptoe to me. I like them to be out there at 50 yards. They're starting to get down close to the ground. So as they come down, the first ones will come down and get low. Then the next ones come over them. They're, they're aggressive like that. They wanna be the first in line. And the, the flock will work its way to you. If you let them get low out at a distance, let them work to you, you're gonna have more success than if you try to get them to spin and just sit right on your face the whole time and make them spin real tight over top. So um, I'm gonna get into the calling here in just a second, but my point with this is on the calm wind days, let them circle wide, let them get down low and let them crawl to you. When you've got more wind, then they're gonna be able to act a little bit more like snow geese and come down more vertically on top. So a lot of times you'll see them crawling over the power lines, they'll get a little higher, a little lower. As they approach your spread, most geese are going to gain altitude because they're sick of getting shot at. So they like to get high just a little bit and check you out and then they'll set up again and start to come in. Now lessers in the sunshine and wind it's a wonderful combination typically works out pretty well um you know you, you see the videos of some of these guys outfit oklahoma or or uh, or, or uh, gosh you see hunter pickett down there in west texas killing them guys in in kansas all over the place i mean when lessers do it right there's nothing like it uh they're, they're a blast to hunt and when you've got the wind and the sunshine it gets fun because they will work they're very predictable they'll come up and they'll they'll work into your into your face and as they start getting close if they don't do it on the first pass when they make a turn they'll typically make it a lot more tight in the wind and they'll crank back around when you hit them with the call so on those corners um you're going to hit them a little bit more than you would uh, a honker because they're just a louder goose they they make some more noise and i'm not saying wall of sound i'm not a proponent of that by any means but um i think realistic sounds in a little bit more quantity than hunting graders is ideal okay um so i'll start kind of getting into the calling a little bit again um we're looking for higher pitched uh a call so it's going to sound more realistic and we like sharp clucks all right sharp clucks push moans spit notes uh some some really cool uh, stuff that on a on a Canada goose call on a, on a I'm sorry a honker call doesn't sound as cool but when you put it into a higher pitch call just because the reed's shorter and the, the setup for a lesser call it sounds really cool and it makes for a really accurate call um, now I'm gonna tell you right now as you're surfing YouTube you're gonna find a ton of videos of guys out there calling lessers and just blowing calls until they are blue in the face and while there are times where that's effective, uh, as it gets later in the year, they don't respond to just noise as well. So 
if, if you're one of the guys like me that likes to think ahead about managing an area and keeping things, uh, you, you know, you might have some really great stuff in November, but you still want to be killing them in January, don't show them your whole deck of cards or your whole hand uh, too early in the season. Save some stuff. Keep it. Give them only what it takes to kill them. Um, and as opposed to where, like I talked about with greater Canada's, I'll make less noise as they're getting close. With lessers, I'll get sharper and a little bit more aggressive. Not necessarily more noise, but just sharper, maybe higher pitch, because it gets them excited. Again, geese talk and, and, and make noise because they're territorial or aggressive. So food's here. Cluck, 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 cluck. Oh, I'm going to go over there where the sound is, and there must be something worth fighting for over there. So uh, keep that in mind. Not necessarily more noise, but just sharper noise. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead, do a little bit of lesser calling. I'm going to do the same scenario, all right? Geese are coming our general direction four or 500 yards out, okay? Um, and I might be using, typically when I'm hunting lessers, I don't just hunt with one call like I do graders. I hunt with two. I've got one that's set up, typical short read setup um, for close in, realistic, really goosey, good lesser sounds. And then I've got another one that I'll blow at a distance, uh, say like a half breed, most killing goose call in the history of history, or the short mag that's very similar to a half breed. It's got the same gut system and reed system, but with just a little bit more conventional setup. Okay, so I'm going to start geese for four or five hundred yards. I'm going to grab my loud call and I'm going to blow at them. And I apologize if the sound's distorted. This thing is loud. Okay, so just to get them coming and to make sure they're coming my direction. <laughs> So really high pitch, really sharp, and the biggest thing that makes these uh, calls like the short mag and like the half breed so successful is the pitch. Uh, and we'll talk about that when we come around to speckle belly calling in a later episode too, but it's not necessarily volume that makes sound carry. Pitch actually carries in the wind better than just blowing a megaphone, uh, you know, amplifying a goose call, okay? So, now, we've got their attention. They're working in towards us. Uh, they're starting to get to that, you know, 100 yard mark. I'm gonna start thinking about trying to get these geese to come sit down and try to work right in on me. Okay, so I, I'm going to bring it down just a little bit in the pitch. Pitch is going to come down, volume is going to come down just a little bit because especially on a calm wind day, too much calling can blow them right out of a hole. You see geese flaring at 50 yards, sometimes there may not be anything wrong with your spread or your hide, but volume could be pushing them out of the area. So I try to get a little bit more quiet um, and as they're working closer, I'll get sharper and sharper. Okay, so 100 yards working their way in. And at this point, they're kind of getting close. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to say they're working in and it's a no wind day, so they're going to circle over us and I'm going to let them go out. I'm going to kind of keep, again, that same pace until they get out, but instead at this time uh, of letting them get 100 plus yards out, around that 50 yard mark is where I'm going to start making a little bit of noise typically, if I've got any wind at all. If it's completely calm, maybe let them get to 100 yards just again to give them more room to get down, lose some altitude and crawl to you. Uh, and, and we're always thinking a player two in advance here, right? So uh, if you've got a little bit of wind where they can be a little more vertical, again, five, 10 miles an hour is enough. At 50 yards, I'm gonna start getting on them a little bit. <laughs> as you hear me come down, that's them making their turn back, all right? Now, once they're coming back, getting right back into that kind of mid-range of calling. <laughs> and then once you start to see the bottom of the flock, there's those couple sucker geese, those, those juvies or, or whatever it may be, just the, the suckers that bring everything in, 
I'm going to try to bring those down. And as they're coming down, I'm going to get a little bit more sharp, high pitch clucks one after the other, or maybe some of these push moans that I'm talking about. Okay. So as they're starting to filter down, and um, that's typically going to get the flock to start centering and get the bottom to fall out right on top of you. Now, hear me talking about those push moans are doing that. It's a cool sound. I wish I could do it like uh, a couple guys I work with in Texas, John David Stanley and Cody Grounds. Scary good. Scary good. But that's, that's about the best I can do at it. Uh, and, and you kind of get the idea. So we're looking for accurate noises, um, sharp, higher pitch calls that are going to get these geese thinking that this is real. Again, all of this is about realism. All right. Um, now, again, the only thing left is talking about calling the shot on lesser Canada's. And when I'm calling the shot on lessers, again, we're, we're talking big flocks typically. And if we've got our big flock of 100 plus geese, if I can get the first 10% to land or so, um, once you call the shot and you've got geese on the ground, the biggest mistake guys make, uh, two big mistakes they make with big flocks. One is flock shooting. That doesn't pan out. Even in the spring, you're gonna have more success if you can pick geese as you're laying out, you know, 14 of your loads. But as these geese are setting down, um, pick a goose and shoot in front of you. These geese aren't typically gonna be stacked vertically as you're looking straight up, but as you're looking out and these geese are finishing in front of you, and again, this is the importance of, of making these geese land in front of you, not right on top of you, they'll start to layer and you'll have the first geese landing and then there's another group behind them and the whole wad's getting low behind them. So you're, you're shooting into a cloud of geese. You're gonna have a lot more success uh, and opportunity for collateral damage. Now, also keep that in mind as you get close to your limit. You don't wanna rain out 15, 20 geese out of a flock. Make sure you're picking out geese that don't have geese behind them. Right back to, to hunter safety 101, make sure you have a safe background to shoot into. If you have three geese left in your limit, a group of 4,000 geese behind the one you're shooting at, not a safe background. So again, the ideal shot call, you've got a lot of limit left, we'll say, let them land, uh, a, a decent portion of them, and shoot the geese that are just touching down. As you take your first shots, those geese are going to fall and the ones on the ground are going to jump and they're going to cross the geese coming up and the geese coming down be in the same spot you'll have the most opportunity for collateral damage and you're going to get your biggest rain outs in that case and uh, you know hunting isn't all about rain outs but just talking about ideal shot calls for lesser canadas that's how i like to do it okay so that's basically it. Um, that's most of what I wanted to talk about today between the differences in hunting greater and lesser Canada's. Again, the graders, you can get away with fewer decoys, spread them way out, make sure you're hidden. And because you don't have a lot of decoys, try to hide outside the spread. As far as the calling goes, less is more for the greater Canada's and they're big. So treat them like those 747s, give them runways, give them lots of room to work. Lessers, they're little fighters. They'll make nice tight turns. They'll, they'll land in a pocket, uh, leave them little loose areas, not even just big holes, uh, but little loose areas, and they'll, they'll land right there amongst your decoys. A little bit more calling, but again, sharp and accurate. Save something, you know, don't, don't always throw them a million miles an hour because if they get out there on, on pass number four or five and you need to turn them, but you've already shown them everything in your arsenal, it's not going to sound as good as if you, you know, give them different levels of excitement. If you save it till the end when you really need it, sometimes you won't need to show it. But when you do, it'll actually mean something. It'll have more effect on these geese, okay? Um, and when they're working, just make sure that you pick out a goose. It's so easy to go up and, and flock shoot into these big groups. It's easy to get excited when you've got, got a ton of geese. Uh, and one more thing I want to touch on, don't scream when you call the shot unless it's super windy and it's super loud and there's no way everybody in your group's going to hear you i mean if, if you want to scream by all means go for it but keep in mind as you scream 
you're going to flare these geese. Personally, when I'm calling a shot, I like to be kind of quiet about it, not trying to sneak anything past my buddy, but I don't want to scare these geese. I want to keep them landing. I, I want my easiest first shot as I can. Um, you know, when I'm on, I'm on like anybody else, but man, when I'm off, I need everything going my way that I can. So um, a gentle shot call, get them guys, you know, just a normal voice. You trust me, your friends are going to be listening for you. You don't have to scream. You don't have to have one guy scream on one side, followed by another guy screaming on the other side of the spread. Call the shot calmly and gently, and then you're going to have better shot opportunities for those guys. But um, really, that's about it. Uh, it's going to do it on this episode of Field Facts with Forrest. And again, please keep those questions coming. You send them directly to me, Forrest with two R's at divebombindustries.com. Just we'll try to get all your questions answered here. And again, thanks for joining me on Field Facts with Forrest. One more thing, go ahead, go down below, click that like button. It makes me feel really good. And while you're at it, why don't you go ahead and subscribe because you're not gonna wanna miss out on this fun and informative series.